Welcome to Pacific Unitarian Universalist Church. Today is the last Sunday in, thanks, uh, in the Thanksgiving weekend and the 29th. Um, a few announcements. Uh, today, De Beneville, or Tuesday, De Beneville is doing a big giving push on that Tuesday. Uh, if you want to go to their website, you know, they've gotten uh, obviously affected greatly by the pandemic, not having campers the entire summer and this essentially this cold winter season as well. Um, they're a great cause. They almost got burned down as if, you know, the pandemic wasn't enough to assault their well-being. So if you if you have an inclination to support our local UU camp, please do so on this Tuesday. Um, 11 o'clock on Tuesday as well, I have my normal uh, Zoom call. You can call in. It's just sort of a chatty time with me and, you know, sometimes big issues, sometimes small ones. That afternoon is also the Senior Covenant Group, which is going to meet at 2 o'clock, not 3 o'clock, on the patio. We pass microphones around. We sit, you know, spaced out. There's only a handful of folks, but uh, if you're a senior, you're invited to come. The Seekers on Wednesday, which is the same outside, passing a sanitized microphone. Seekers is a group that, oh, we talk about a number of just thematic things. It's a little covenant group of sorts, but it's open. Um, this afternoon, as always, at one o'clock, there's a deeper dive conversation on racism that's uh, available on Zoom. You can check the website for that. I also encourage you, if you in have interest in classical music at all, we host the uh, South Bay Chamber Music Society, and they're in here filming you know, a couple times a month for the winter season, and the, you know, the acoustics on that are beautiful. You can often see the, the greenery, and they're spreading themselves around, so... If you have any interest in classical music, take a peek at the South Bay Chamber Music Society, which films here. Uh, you'll see the newsletter very soon. We've got a holiday toy drive headed our way. And uh, if you want to sort of buy toys, if you can check into the website, you'll see in the newsletter, it's for Rainbow Services, which does domestic violence support for families. So all good stuff, a ways to make a difference here if you can. Uh, Kelly, our, you know, wonderful everything gal around here these days, not even a member, has gotten more postcards for uh, Georgia to support democracy. So if you have an interest in that, you can call me, call the office, uh, call Kelly if you have her information. Um, next Sunday at 6 p.m., there's going to be a Defend Democracy kind of car parade around San Pedro. Uh, hosted by Owen Rachel Brunke. I'll be participating in it. So if you want to have a, a public show of sort of the support of democracy um, in these times when that feels challenged in the oddest of ways, uh, please do. So I'm going to slip my mask back on and invite Darcy to come up and light our and say our chalice words while I light them. Happy 
Hello, dear friends. I'm sort of hallucinating. Instead of seeing an empty sanctuary where there's six or seven of us, uh, the people that are making this happen, I'm imagining that I see all your faces in front of me, which we'll be, we'll be back to that one of these days. There is no halfway between truth and nonviolence on the one hand and untruth and violence on the other hand. We may never be strong enough to in, be entirely nonviolent in thought and word and deed, but we must be entirely nonviolent. We must keep nonviolence as our goal and make steady progress towards it. The attainment of freedom, whether for a man, a nation, or a world, must be an exact proportion to the attainment of nonviolence by each. That's by Mohandas Gandhi. Thank you, Darcy. If Darcy is envisioning people filling this sanctuary, then I'll have what she's having. <laughs> um, today's service is about violence, and it's about uh, the cycles of violence. I was thinking about this in relation to two things perk this. It was um, Erica Bennis came in and talked to us on one of our race programs um, about trauma. And then I was thinking about the Proud Boys and just sort of like the kind of threats that are presented at different sites around, you know, with guns and kind of a new era of that kind of thing. But this is traditionally the time where we have these two pockets of family time, traditionally, who knows what this year brings in terms of collective time with anyone. But when traditionally these families come together at Thanksgiving for a bunch, and then they come together for Christmas, Hanukkah season, sort of New Year's season for a bunch as well. It's a great time where we can fall into old patterns of behavior really easily. It's the time of year we can traditionally feel guilty enough for not um, being grateful for all that we have that's in our closets and our cupboards, or we can feel terrible about enough for not having enough things in our closets or our cupboards. It's a, it's a loaded time. It's, it's a time for high school reunions usually when we're looking back over our shoulder and taking stock on things, you know, the soldiers overseas, it's a, it's a pandemic. It's, you know, it's loaded times. Like all years, when we think about the election transition, there's been this, you know, shadow of violence hanging over it. Um, if we are to step back though, that shadow of violence is always there. You know, in the Iraq and, and Afghanistan wars for the people who face violence all year, all year round, back before that, just cycles and cycles of violence. So I thought it would take a time to take a cool sort of distanced look at uh, how violence affects us and the consequences of it. And um, that is all worlds ahead. Uh, Severin's going to Engage us in our opening hymn. Please sing along at home if you can. We're going to sit at the welcome table.
I'd like to gather the kids in front of us as we would here normally on the rug if you're at home and you're a younger person. Muscle your way to the front of the screen. <laughs> um, so today's topic in terms of church is about violence, and it's really kind of about the legacy that lot of violence leaves behind. So our message is, I, I, I we to run an experiment today. I want you to do, if anyone's around you, especially if they're in another room, I want you to do a little wet willy to people. And this is, uh, you know, it's when you lick your, your pinky, and then you unwittingly sneak up on someone and you stick it in their ear and it's kind of gross and it generally, nobody likes it. Nobody wants a wet willy. It's kind of fun to give them. So I want you to go off and do that or at least think about it while I talk about the legacy of trauma and violence because that's a fun little gross thing that you can do to someone. But if you think about how long it takes to give a wet willy or how long it takes to throw a punch, or how long it takes to say an unkind word, that's like this much time. Maybe the camera can come in a little closer on my stone. So time just moves, right? The clock, the hands on the clock always click, and they just click at the same pace, right? You notice there's an incredible regularity to how things work. An hour is always 60 minutes, and right? all of that, but sometimes in things that are more serious than a wet willy, this becomes this in terms of its impact, right? Sometimes things happen to us and to people and they, uh, people are abused or they're hurt or even unkind words can do this. And the little bit of time it takes to do something Something mean in particular can sometimes live with people like this. So one of the things in this church, you know, we don't have a, we, we're, we're, we come from the Christian tradition and this looks and, and like a lot like a church, but we, we realize that across all the religions, there's that wisdom there that little things can make a good positive difference or little things can make an incredibly important impactful, big difference. And therapists and people, you know, who try to help other people are very aware of that. And so when you think about your life, most of your life is just going to be lived in a normal kind of way around the clock. But big things can have a big impact. So I want you in your life to think about having all your little moments turn into big positive moments and try to work really hard to make sure that they don't turn into big negative moments, right? People, as you know, at school and stuff, some people are mean or not mean to one another. That can leave a legacy deep in people's hearts. So if you're a bully, please don't be a bully anymore. You'll have a legacy that you do not want behind you that we need to change. And part of the world only gets better when people don't traumatize one another with violence. That's the basic theme. All the adults can shut off the television if they want to. Um, but that's really what we're talking about today. And there we go. So that's a good lead into joys and concerns. And I'm going to light our joys and concerns candles. for all those things that remain unsaid. As we know, we usually have people come up and talk about their sick cats and graduating seniors and all that stuff, but we, we're going to hold in our hearts all that remains unsaid for everyone. And I invite Darcy to uh, join us and share with us our prayer. This is called Choose to Bless the World by Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. Um, I quite like just the name alone, Choose to Bless the World. Because, uh, the, the choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a simple moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It's an act of recognition 
a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And where there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless that world live their lives as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and for this rage. We've all heard the story of David and Goliath, at least in uh, forms. Here's how it appears in scripture. This is our reading. And, out, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head. Did you imagine him? And he had a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So he had a big protective outfit on. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and he slung it and it smote the Philistine in the head, forehead and that stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. That's almost exactly 3,000 years ago. A young agile king to be, David, mythically or true, was slaying the big Goliath in the Near East. Even further back in a galaxy far, far away, the young Jedi Luke Skywalker crawls into his ship. We've all seen this even more so set in our brains and sets sail for the Death Star, comes down that alleyway, closes his eyes, and saves the day for the righteous underdog freedom-fighting Jedi. And in the film I just saw, The History of Violence, the film set in pre-pandemic Millbrook, Indiana, we find small-town good guy Tom Stahl working behind the counter of a diner during a robbery. And during this break-in, he surprises us all because we've seen nothing but this placid, homespun good guy. He gets the better of these two bad guys instantaneously. He smashes one over the head with his coffee pot, one gun-wielding robber, and then he slides across the counter to take out another bad guy who's ready to kill a waitress. We realize in an instant that he is not the talented novice, but... This is something he's done before. It's the turning point in the movie. This 15-year-old film now is from 2005. 
I didn't know that. Seems relevant, relevant. It's on Netflix. It's an interesting take on heroism. For our purposes today, we're not here to talk about heroism, really. The title suggests the legacy the violence leaves. The title of the film is called The Consequences of Violence. And we love our heroes for their quick reflexes and their agile and their courage and all of that. And we should. We should. And I'm no pacifist. I feel violence and physical aggression is at times in the face of evil called for. It's even courageous. I can stand here and say that I am grateful for those who have the bravery of putting themselves second to a broader cause. Sort of what I love about Memorial Day. And to defend what they think is right, even at times with fists and a gun. Some bullies, after all, as we know, don't reform with a good dose of self-esteem or even a stern reprimand. However, the sermon begins, the point of the sermon is that when we miss in the credits of our lovely Luke Skywalker and our heroic David is, of course, we don't feel while the adrenaline is pumping through our bloodstreams reading or watching the film or slinging, you know, rocks or fighting fire pilots flying fighter pilots, we don't feel the loss of Goliath's loved ones, the tribe of the Goths who've lost their heroes. We don't feel their new found shaken vulnerability. We don't feel in the moment that Luke hits that miracle shot into the Death Star and blows it up, the thousands of lives lost. It's hard to think with all that enthusiasm that the children's children lost in battle have no dads or maybe moms tomorrow. That truth kills the buzz a little. And we're not over the glow as, as the titles of the next film suggests, right? We're title the glow of the Jedi victory to realize what happens next. The Empire strikes back. I don't even have to tell you that. It's so clear clear in habit, in life, and it's clear in the title of the film. We're, of course, at the tail end of a holiday that glosses over the violence of basically stealing, conning, murdering, and spreading disease our way across a continent with a mythic meal of goodwill where we pleasantly pass the potatoes. So this tone of this holiday is always wonderful. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, but it, it's just set in a mistruth to a large degree. And the same mistruth is set for the history of violence, where we're introduced to this seemingly good guy, and he loves his kids, and he works the diner. And the, we realize about a fifth of the way through the movie, they wait a long time to reveal this that the way that this man handles his assailants leads to a past we haven't known. And his heroic act makes the local paper and it attracts people back in Philly, crime fighters who know, know Tom Stahl, our protagonist, not as the beloved ta small town businessman, but as the former Philly hitman, Joey Caraco. What's revealed to us while we watch this is the unwinding of a legacy of nonviolence back into violence. A man who, unbeknownst to his wife, was a former hitman and has been in the witness protection program for turning state evidence against the mob. The second two thirds of the movie is punctuated by these, punctuated by these creepy encounters with the gangsters that stall, installs past to increase their threats and presence in the life of this pleasant little small town of Indiana. Scene by scene, we get to witness the creepy return of violence into Joey's life. The history of violence, the title of the film, is that although initially in the movie, Tom, or, or better, Joey's violence benefits him, it comes back to haunt him, as it generally does. And this is, film is little more than one anecdote, one example of the minor in which, manner in which violence comes back to haunt all of us. And it's a universal truth, isn't it? It's the classic statement captured by an eye for an eye, and suddenly the world, the whole world, is blind. At some point, someone has to stop returning violence for violence.
and not being able to walk away from violence. You can feel it when you're in a fight with your loved ones. You can feel you want that last barb, even if it's not physical. It is very hard. It's almost cliche of human nature to have a hard time resisting that last punch or word. When I was an undergrad, I majored in corporate communications. Corporate communications, it's hard for me to believe to actually. For a while with no real intention of ever being involved there, I, I went into this tra college training program, it was the best thing the college did. And I found myself towards the end of the year uh, being interviewed for, uh, being selected to be interviewed for this Arthur Anderson post. I'm only sharing this because I just remember how funny it was that they didn't know that I was spending my spare time protesting corporations and sticking popsicle sticks in the grounds representing the number of war nuclear warheads that threatened all of our lives. I got the irony then and I get it now too. But the, the best or worst of this corporate communications training left me with a, a skill that I've sort of never forgotten. It was called ISD, Instructional Systems Design. It was kind of boring. And it was really, in essence, the technique of putting, breaking down tasks in a training formula simple enough that eventually any skill could be thought to be taught to anyone. For example, squeeze the toothpaste onto the brush. The toothpaste adequately covers two thirds of the bristles. Go to next step two. If not, repeat step one. Wet the toothbrush, step two. You can figure it out from there. The funny thing about ISD is it was probably the thing that stuck with me the longest. And for years, I worked uh, in, with developmentally disabled or, or cognitively challenged folks and used a lot of those skills because that's some of the ways in which skill-based training implies. But it also just simply lays out the very clear way in which one thing leads to another. In simple behavioral terms, when we look at percentages, if we were to look at what happens in a violent act, you'd probably summarize it by this. An act of violence takes place. And in the moment, it's a trigger pull or a punch or a word. There's a release of pent up energy that feels pretty liberating, followed by sadness, hurt, loss, quite naturally, often the return of violence from the other party. The empire generally does always strike back, right? So breaking down into those, in these kind of actions can train corporate hires or it can teach a developmentally disabled folk person how to brush their teeth better. We can also chart how violence and anger moves. The most violent and angry minds that never learn to pause the cycle of violence really never separate the correlation between she brought over her mother-in-law and I felt compelled to hit her. One of the chief techniques of working with people with anger issues is to invite that angry person to pull apart the antecedent they believe is a direct cause or a trigger to their violence itself. In regards to violence beha violent behavior, there needs to be inserted a pause. I think we've seen that pause. We've seen the threat of violence in this particular time around the election. We haven't quite seen that much violence. Thankfully, we're in that pause mode, may it last. Undoing violence and, and, and anger essentially means pulling apart the time between an antecedent and a violent act. A former parishioner of mine who worked with uh, domestic violence perpetrators would begin his group sessions by saying, when is it okay to hit your spouse? The answer, of course, for most people is never unless it's an act of self-defense of some kind. But when he asked these domestic violence abusers that question, he said it took forever for the abusers to get the idea that never was it really okay to hit someone. Never took a long time to get to. And that's one of the many choices we have. Maybe on this Thanksgiving weekend, you don't have a problem with violence. Maybe it's a pattern within your behavior. Maybe the, maybe the pause is that you're not going to take the bait of your brother, which will inevitably lead to trouble. Maybe it's the, you know, you're not going to take your mother's bait on this particular one, whatever it happens to be. 
Dr. Albert Ellis, we talked about anger, I don't know, six months ago or so, but I think the interesting thing about anger is that it's an emotion that's uniquely connected to the nervous system. And although the consequences of the person receiving the anger might be minimizing, and we talked about traumatizing, it generally makes the person producing the anger feel powerful. Anger is exciting and liberating. This is what makes the cycle of violence so destructive and hard. It feels good in the moment to respond that way. I think we've all seen that. Of the seven hardwired emotions that cross-culturally appear in the faces of humans, they are surprise, contempt, disgust, happiness, sadness, fearfulness, and anger. Anger is the one that provides the momentary rush of power and potency, and with it, a momentary cessation of doubt and pause that the other feelings often bring. If that doesn't make any sense, think about how hard it would be to design a video game, not where action was required, where feeling and sh where shooting is required, but where feeling, where feeling sadness <laughs> or feeling fear or disgust was what needed to be expressed in order to move forward in the game. It'd be a much harder game to play. And as any therapist or anyone who works with people or working on your own stuff needs to know, courage is required to step into that difficult place. It's almost like the study of racism that we're in this church broadly engaging. This is not something that's fun. It is something that you do for the world and you do for your own sense of conscience and values and to make the world a better place. It doesn't feel good to do the good hard work of the world. If it did, it, we'd have a more peaceful place. So, when we think about our heroes, when we think about those stories, I pause, I asked you to pause and think about the adrenaline rush and the thrill of that, but pause to think about the legacy of that as well. There was a popular book called War is the Force that Gives Us Meaning, and I I read it and I just, it, it, it's the it's war reporters talking about the excitement it takes, you know, when to be in that kind of environment and how hard it is to come back to civilian life and live a normal life. Let's think about the shrinking spirit of esteem that violence perpetrates, anger perpetrates, trauma perpetrates as you live your life. Let's be people that break that loop that pull antecedents away from natural consequences. Let's be that people and those people who do that. I invite you to give to the institution that, that brings you this and, and supports it. And I invite Darcy to come forward and share with us our offertory Three churches, a Baptist, a Methodist, and the local Episcopal churches decided to work together to sponsor a town-wide revival. After the revival was over, the three pastors were discussing the results. The Methodist minister said, The revival worked out great for us. We gained four new families. The Baptist preacher said, we did better than that. We gained six new families. The Episcopal priest said, well, we did even better than that. We unloaded 10 of our biggest troublemaking families. Please give generously to this church.
Let us remember that this church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all of our differences and beneath all of our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time and death and the space between the stars. We pause in silent witness to that unity. So may the blessing of love be upon you. May love's peace abide with you. May love's presence illuminate your hearts, now and forevermore. So be it. Amen. Shalom. Salam. Namaste. And as we always say, and now our service truly begins. Mm -hmm.